Are you missing one more? You are looking good. Good morning. Good morning. Is this the faith community of New York City or what? We did it. We're here. Good morning to everyone. I am Pastor Gil Monroe's. And I serve as the faith advisor to the mayor of New York City and also to run the Office of Faith-Based and Community Partnerships, which will be working with NIDAS and our partners to oversee uh, our new partnership with our faith community. And so as we have witnessed an unprecedented influx of migrants uh, to New York City, and so some call it a crisis, we call it an opportunity for the faith community to do the work that they will normally do, which is providing compassion, comfort, and care to all New Yorkers. Whether you are on house, a street homeless, or migrants coming to a city fleeing your country, to raise your family in peace and have an opportunity for a better future, the faith community stands ready to work with New York City in order to support migrants who are here. And so as it has been written in the Statue of Liberty. It says, give me your tired, your poor, your humble masses yearning to breathe free. And today I am really grateful to stand with faith leaders who have and will continue to open their doors to asylum seekers, providing their space and hand of community to care for them. Truly, New York is a city of faith. And so we are totally uh, uh, happy and, and really blessed to be here today with our faith leaders who are here and those who are across the city to be able to announce this program. Now I'll bring to the podium the Mayor of New York City, Eric Adams. Thank thank, thanks so much, Pastor Monroe. And I guess this is an uh, uh, opportunity built on a crisis. Uh, because we are facing a crisis as it continues uh, to unfold. And this administration has been staying ahead of the crisis. And I would say over and over again that uh, when you look at other municipalities, you're seeing people sleep on the streets. You'll see people sleeping in airports. Uh, you'll see people uh, really trying to manage a crisis that we're doing so. And over and over again, I believe we are a victim of our managerial uh, skills with the deputy mayor and her team and Pastor Morose, uh, uh, Pastor Salgado and others who have just successfully uh, addressed this issue in real time. That's ever folding, it's unfolding every day. And we, we have a tendency to believe that it, it's, it goes away, uh, but it's not. We're still receiving a large number of migrant and asylum seekers who are coming to uh, the city and looking uh, for care. And as we have always uh, partnered with our faith community, back from our days, uh, Pastor Moros uh, and I, a part of uh, Brooklyn Ball President, it was our faith leaders that was that they were with us uh, throughout many of the tragedies that we faced, and particularly during COVID. Uh, they were there over and over again, opening their houses of worship as we stood with them uh, to push to get their houses of worship open because they played a vital role in the recovery aspect. And many of our food pantries, they are located in our faith-based uh, entities from our mosques, our synagogues, our churches, uh, our Sikh temples. Our Sikh temples, they give out free meals uh, Every uh, weekend when I go and visit one, people are there uh, to get uh, meals, even if you're not of the same faith. So this is a natural fit. And it was incorrectly reported that we turned away of faith leaders. We were in a process for months of sitting down with our faith leaders, uh, trying to navigate many of the complexities that are associated with how to use of spaces as a place for respite centers and for places that people can sleep and at the same time maintain uh, the worship and services that take place in our various houses of worship. The faith-based community has never been off our radar. They have always been part of everything we do here and planning around proactive and 
responding to a crisis, there's always a piece of this that we bring in our faith-based community. And so uh, I want to thank Pastor Morose. This was a challenging time, not navigating God, but navigating government. And, and, and getting government to understand that the rules cannot get in the way when you're dealing with a crisis is sometimes difficult, uh, but we use the term GSD for a reason, uh, God getting stuff done. And that is what the houses of worship that are here are doing. And so I want to thank all of these leaders that are behind us uh, from different uh, walks of life, uh, different uh, faith institutions, and no matter what faith you practice, uh, it is in all of our faith that we are supposed to care for those who are in need. Not only is it on the Statue of Liberty, but it is on our text that we look and read and study from. And just as a Christian, Chris, scripture reminds us, love thy neighbor as thyself and welcome the stranger among us. And New York City has been living up to that. When you look at what we have done, uh, over 70,000 migrant and asylum seekers that entered the city, as well as taking care of those who were here already in need of care, we have been do doing that. So today, I'm proud to announce a new partnership with the New York Disaster Interfaith Services. Uh, they uh, have been doing this work already um, during uh, crises in the past, and it's just really, uh, really something to think about when you think when you see off the radar just doing the work every day and we cannot thank them enough can I thank you enough for what you're doing as representatives I hear well this will allow us to help our faith community shelter those in need of housing of housing at using houses of worship throughout the five boroughs of the program which delivers on our commitment and our asylum seeker blueprint we laid this out in the blueprint, and now we are actually continuing to uh, put in place the things that we stand in. We we'll expand the amount of emergency shelter available to asylum seekers, helping to ease the strain on New York City's existing shelter system, and integrating asylum seekers into local communities. That's why this is a win-win. Uh, it's an amazing return on our investment. It is allowing us to have asylum seekers be a part of a community, because that's the best way uh, for individuals to really incorporate themselves in the daily lives of New York City. Up to 50 houses of worship will be able to take part in this program to start with, offering shelter to a combined nearly 1,000 asylum seekers. Uh, participating sites will offer safe shelter every day with meals, uh, services, clothing donations, and the other services traditionally offered at our other shelter sites. Uh, beyond opening their doors and providing these services, these sites will also connect asylum seekers with strong community networks. That is so important when you look at uh, the feeling of isolation and not being part of a community. When I visited some of the shelters uh, this over the weekend, some of the uh, HERCs, uh, and speaking to the people there, uh, they love the city, they want to work in the city, and they want to be part of a community and network in the city. And that's what the faith-based institutions are going to do. Uh, through our hard times and difficult crisis, uh, our faith leaders and communities have been there for New Yorkers over and over again. And we believe this is the step in another direction that we can help address this crisis that we're facing. We're asking those who are interested, uh, interested in faith institutions can visit nydis.org to see the program requirements and fill out the survey to support asylum seekers. And even if you have a location that is not large enough to house someone, uh, there's a role for everyone here and we're asking uh, all of our faith-based institutions to get involved and get engaged as they have been doing for so many years. Uh, this influx of asylum seekers is a serious crisis, one that New York City is facing largely on our own. It's unfair and it's not right that New York is going through this. Through May 31st, we spent over $1.2 billion on this crisis, already doubled what the IBO inaccurately estimated for this entire year. There's a lot of people putting out predictions on dollar amounts, but numbers don't lie. 
$2.2 billion since May 31st. Despite these staggering costs, the federal government has allocated less than $40 million in funding. That's enough to pay for five days. National crisis being paid by taxpayers in New York, and we receive from FEMA enough to pay for five days. Even with difficult circumstances that we've been under, I cannot say how proud I am of the team and the leadership of Deputy Mayor uh, Williams Ison, who has just really uh, managed this crisis and just showed you know, true, true leadership uh, during difficult moments. Uh, every other day, another aspect of this crisis reveals itself, and her team has been navigating over and over again. We saw what happened a few days ago at Lincoln, a correctional facility, uh, and how she had to manage that crisis and make sure that we can get it up and operating. And I, I just really believe the record has not been accurately reported on what this administration and under her leadership, what it has accomplished. We saw, supported over 72,000 asylum seekers, opened over 160 sites for asylum seekers to rest their heads and receive services and help people in need get health care, education, legal aid, and so much more. We're doing our job here in the city, and we need this national problem to be addressed by our national leaders. We want a realistic plan that begins with a robust decompression strategy at our southern border. 108,000 cities, villages, towns. It's time for all of us to address this national problem. We want to declare a national state of emergency here in the state to get additional resources in. Uh, the federal government could do this, and we're calling on that. We want a real immigration reform, and the Republican Party must stop preventing this from happening. And we have to allow people to vote. There could be nothing in this crisis that's more anti-American than individuals coming to this country and they cannot work to provide for themselves. That is the cornerstone and the bedrock of America, your right to work. To come to this country and you're told that you cannot work is just unfair to those who are picking up the course and it's unfair to those who came here to pursue the American dream. It is a nightmare not to be able to work to provide for yourself. Let's give the asylum seekers and the migrants the right to work and not allow politics to get in the way of people wanting to provide for themselves. We saw a few weeks ago, I stood with Governor Hochul and lo local labor and business leaders all combined saying, we have jobs available. Let's give them the opportunity to, to work in these fields. This, was allow this would allow asylum seekers to start providing for themselves, something they say repeatedly. As I walked through the Roosevelt Hotel, I heard it in many different languages, people want to work. Let's give them the right to do so. With the support and part partnership of so many, including our faith-based communities, I want to really thank them for being here today and then inspiring others uh, to step up and ensure that we get this job done. We have been doing it, and we're going to continue to do our part, and I'm glad to be here with our faith leaders that are stating they're willing to do their part. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Pastor. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. And. And um, thank you all again. Um, and, and so now we'll have Peter Gaditis, who is uh, the president of, of NIDAS, who will be running our program. And so Peter, you can come to the podium. Good morning. I first want to thank the mayor for his vision and long-term partnership in working with faith communities to address many of the challenges our city faces. Uh, and certainly to Pastor Monrose and Danny Cabrera in the housing office for uh, getting us to this point in the contracting process. Uh, it's been light speed for a city contract, um, but that's still a few months. Uh, our opportunity here is to work with houses of worship that have a sacred calling uh, to offer hospitality to the stranger. Uh, and to give them dignity and hope uh, when they have potentially lost that along their journey here to the United States. These asylum seekers and migrants who've come from Central and South America as well as West Africa 
through an arduous journey, a traumatizing journey, will now have the opportunity to live in small group shelters of 19, as the mayor stated, uh, in what we hope is a program that will expand beyond the initial 50 houses of worship, uh, as well as five hospitality centers that will be open uh, during daytime where uh, these individuals can come and seek a variety of services, have access to showers, uh, food, uh, legal assistance, uh, new clothing, uh, and those things that they require uh, to live here while they await their day in court uh, or their opportunity to work. Uh, we certainly join uh, the mayor's administration in calling on the federal government to expedite the work process for all of these uh, individuals who are coming here seeking asylum. Many of them uh, want to work uh, and certainly want to contribute to the city's economy by being a part of this community. Uh, and we welcome them, of course, with open arms. Uh, I want to thank some of the other organizations that are going to be partnering with us. Uh, Project Hospitality, which will be running the shelters on Staten Island, as well as the Interfaith Center of New York that will join us in working to recruit congregations of all faith traditions uh, to open their doors as shelter space. Trinity Church Wall Street, the Suu Kyi Foundation, Delivering Good, Islamic Relief USA. Uh, these are other organizations that are donating both supplies uh, to the shelters as well as goods to the individuals who will be our guests over the coming years as they uh, find their way uh, into uh, the job force and uh, hopefully to uh, a path to citizenship, uh, if that's uh, what their court proceedings allow anyway. Um, I am grateful uh, to my colleague, Jennifer Cannon, to my left here, who'll be running uh, this program for NIDUS. Uh, NIDUS was founded in the aftermath of 9-11, uh, responding with faith-based organizations across the city to, re uh, to support uh, both first responders and civilians who were impacted by that terrorist event and the many thousands of people left unemployed. Uh, and to this day, over the many programs we offer, we also uh, run an emergency shelter network that citywide has 38 shelters that house people in houses of worship every night uh, who are individuals that uh, find themselves living on our streets and in need of emergency placements. So we're also hoping that beyond the life of this contract, uh, that the houses of worship who do open their doors to asylum seekers will continue to see an opportunity to, ser to serve our city long-term uh, in providing shelter space uh, for New Yorkers uh, who find themselves living on the streets uh, and in need of emergency shelter. Uh, so there's a vision here. Uh, we wholly support the mayor's uh, efforts and want to applaud everything New York has done uh, to help asylees the right thing to do uh, versus the wrong thing to do, which is taking people and shipping them around for political purposes rather than actually bringing them dignity and hope. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Peter, for that. And um, really appreciate the comments. And we're seeing again uh, the work that the faith community is called to do in the city. And so we're grateful to Peter and his leadership on, on this as well. Next is we're going to have uh, Sonia Ali, who is going to uh, come from a, a perspective of actually um, doing the work already and her continued partnership with us and the, her community. Oh, there you are. Yeah, sure. Asalaamu As Alaikum. Peace and blessings upon you and good morning. My name is Sonia Ali. I am the executive director of the Muslim Community Center located in Sunset Park, Brooklyn. As we are all in awareness, New York City and the metropolitan area is in the midst of an ongoing humanitarian crisis. During these trying times, Mayor Adams has been doing everything in his capacity with his tenacity and empathetic strength to help the migrants coming into our great city. For Muslims and faith leaders across the city, it is an honor to be in the presence of the skillful leadership of Mayor Eric Adams, 
during these testing times. In addition to being in solidarity with the city of New York, we are truly blessed to be amongst friends from our faith communities. By the will of God, New York City has been chosen to be one of the many communities to serve those who are in need. We, as houses of worship, are honored to step up and help the mayor's office to provide safe shelter for these families who are seeking a better life for themselves and their children. As people of faith, we know that faith should not just reside in our hearts, but it should translate into action. As Muslims, as people of faith, we are ready to step up and be there for our brothers and sisters in humanity. It is said in Muslim scripture, love for your brother what you love for yourself. There is no time better than now to live up to these words and make them a reality. Thank you, Mayor Adams, for all that you do. And thank you, faith leaders, for being a shining light in this great city that we call New York. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much for those, uh, ki thank you so much for those kind words. And now we have Reverend Terry Troa from Staten Island with Project Hospitality. We too are also honored and humbled to stand by the side of our mayor in solidarity with the city of New York, doing what God has called us to do, which is to welcome the stranger in. For the last 40 years, Project Hospitality, an interfaith effort on Staten Island, has coordinated faith-based shelters for people in need, for homeless people on the streets. 40 years, even through the pandemic, we were the only houses of worship in the city of New York that stayed open every night to provide for people in need, despite the risk to the volunteers that may have been exposed to COVID in those nights. And during the pandemic, we opened up an immigrant shelter that I slept in for nearly six months every night until we could get other volunteers to join us. It's that work that brings us to today to say that we have at least two houses of worship on Staten Island who have stepped forward and they will be opening up their doors to people in need who have come to this country seeking refuge. So brothers and sisters of faith, this is the moment. If we love God as God loves us, if we care for others as God cares for us, if we seek justice for the least of our brothers and sisters, as God is justice seeker for his whole creation, then now we need to step up, step out. <laughs> we need to open our hearts as we open our doors and welcome others as God welcomes us each moment of our lives. As God enters into our lives with mercy, so may every house of worship allow brothers and sisters, asylum seekers to enter into their lives and to enter their sacred space, which is God's sacred space, not our own. Hmm. We call on people to let go of the secular worries of this world, which sometimes preoccupy what we call our sacred spaces, and instead to trust that God has led us to this moment and the very places where we offer prayer are the places where we need to offer sanctuary and shelter because that act makes that ground, that building, that place, and us sacred in the eyes of God, doing the divine activity we are called to love our neighbor in need, to love others as God loves us. Amen. 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 That's good. Could we say amen? Amen. That was really good. Could we say amen again? Amen. One more time. Could we say amen? Amen. That was good. Um, what am I doing now? I'm taking, um, oh, we open up the questions. All right. Uh, uh, first of all, yes. Uh, we, got, we, got, we have um, forever Bob President Councilman Miguel Brewer. That's right. Come on. You can say a few words. <laughs> my, 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 my. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. I'm here because I am very excited about this program. I've known the work that has been going on with the emergency shelters for many years. I think at one time we saved them because de Blasio was going to do something terrible. I don't remember. But we saved them. <laughs> <laughs> and this community will do what is not always possible in a larger community setting, which is to work with the individuals. Right now, on the Upper West Side, we have Broadway communities, and we have St. Paul and St. Andrew, which are doing exactly what is being discussed today. They are sending people who want to go elsewhere. People are getting jobs, legal or illegal. I don't care, they're working. <laughs> and they're getting support from the neighborhood for the families, clothing, everything that is needed. So that kind of personal attention is incredibly important. So that's why it's so exciting to be here today because I know every one of these faith leaders will do that. And I'm certainly supportive of working. I've been saying that from the very beginning. Mr. President, sign those damn papers. Thank you. <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, I remember during Borough President, we went to one of the shelters that was in the synagogue in Park Slope, and we stayed overnight with the men that were there, and it was very uh, revealing of, you know, who's there. You know, I think there's a misconception of who's in shelters. I think there's a misconception of people who are seeking asylums here. Uh, and if you don't spend time speaking with individuals, then you, you'll you take another narrative. And I thought it was fitting when Deputy Mayor Isom and I were at Roosevelt Hotel, there was a gentleman there named Omar. Uh, Omar's uh, mom came here with uh, her children uh, going months through the jungle, uh, being sexually abused, coming here, living with three children on the street. And she provided for them. Eventually, she was able to, to get some form of employment. They were able to eventually get a home for themselves. Uh, Omar is now the supervisor over at the Roosevelt Hotel taking care of the asylum seekers who are there. You know, this is a narrative that those who have gone through the narrative are now trying to help people who are now currently in the narrative. Uh, from an Omar to Commissioner Castro, uh, these are real personal stories. And every time people go and see what's happening, they are reliving their own journey and their own narrative and their own story. And that is why we try to be as compassionate and as caring as possible. And so in spite of you know, all of the daily incoming of what we are going through, we're waking up every day realizing we have a mission, we're focused, we're disciplined, and we're executing on it. It is my vision uh, to take the next step to this, to go to the faith-based uh, locales, and then move to uh, private residents. Uh, there are residents who are suffering right now because of economic challenges. They have spare rooms, uh, they have locales, and if we can find a way to get over the 30-day rule and other rules that government has in, in its place, we can take that $4.2 billion, $4.3 it may be now, that we potentially have to spend, and we can put it back in the pockets of everyday New Yorkers, everyday houses of worship, instead of putting it in the pockets of corporations, and some of those corporations come from outside our city. We should be recycling our own dollar, we, dollars, we should take this crisis and go to opportunities. That is how we can deal with this. But I want to be clear on this. This is not sustainable. We, we need to be clear. This is not sustainable. We cannot continue to sustain this with the inflow that we're receiving. So because we are managing this, I don't want anyone to believe that this is sustainable because it is not. We need work permits, we need a decompression strategy, we need real immigration reform. Some of that is long term, but there are immediate needs that this city needs. Uh, so we'll open up to a few questions. Are you speaking on questions? Um, Katie? Hi, Mayor. What's going on, Katie? Yeah. Great having you. Good. I wanted to ask you, related to the, you know, the asylum seeker crisis, I mean, this will take off some of the pressure of the places you've set up for asylum seekers, but I know one place that I believe is still seeking approval from the FAA is the use of hangars at JFK Airport. So I was curious if you could give us an update as to where that stands. I forget the capacity of how many would be in that hangar, but it would take off some of the pressure, but do you have an update on whether or not it's going to 
Uh, yes, um, we, uh, we have the approval on all the different levels but one. And once we get that final approval, then we can execute our plan. So we're just waiting on approval on one more level. Uh, we don't, I don't want to go into the level because I don't want y'all harassing them. Once we get it, I'll let you know. Good morning, Mr. Hey, Juliet, how are you? All right, thanks. How are you? Good, good, good. Um, I wanted to follow up on your suggestion here about private residences. Would you be subsidizing uh, families or landlords for that, number one? Number two, uh, basement apartments are currently you know, illegal. Would, would that change, or how do you... How do you work with that? Uh, first of all, we never put anyone in an illegal setting, and we were hoping, and we're still com continuing to push in our Albany plan to look at basement apartments so that we can legalize them and put them on the pathway to legali legalization. <clears throat> uh, and yes, we would uh, subsidize. It is cheaper for us to have, first of all, it's cheaper and it's a good investment for us to go to a, uh, a family and assist them instead of placing people in large congregate settings or in these emergency hotels. And then if you are a family member where you are bilingual, you're going to be able to help the bilingual person that's coming here. Uh, we're receiving, I saw at the Roosevelt Hotel, we're receiving uh, some of our Haitian refugees and asylum seekers. If you um, speak Creole, you can help that family. The closer we bring the asylum seekers and the migrants to everyday New Yorkers, the easier it will be for them to transition into uh, society. And then with the landlord, let's say, in a private residence or a two-family house or something, would that be um, a lease with the city? How, how, how That's what we try to navigate all the rules of how to get it done. There are many layers to how someone can use their space. We want to we want to make sure that we follow all the rules, and those rules that need to be changed are within my power. We will push to do so. If there's rules that need to be changed on the state level, we're going to reach out to our state colleagues to do so. Mr. Mayor, um, what's the update at the Lincoln Correctional Facility, and where were some of those migrants moved temporarily? I know someone upstate. Um, where are those people now, and have they been moved back to Lincoln Correctional? Uh, the, uh, the state gave us the facility, and I want to thank the governor for giving us that facility. And they had an issue with some of their piping, and um, they were temporarily moved to other locations. We also brought buses there. Uh, uh, Deputy Mayor williams Ison was uh, on the ground, and her team was on the ground. We brought buses there for those who did not want to go to a new location and to wait it out. Uh, the plumbers arrived, they were able to rectify the problem, and we were able to m move people back into the facility. Uh, Mr. Mayor, just one federal, one yeah. last question. On the federal Stop suit, man. Okay. <laughs> uh, with this sort of dead ceiling situation kind of put to bed, I'm wondering if that's at all changed the tenor, or do you expect it to change the tenor of your conversations with the administration about both financial aid, logistical aid, the use of humanitarian control, and all these sort of other programs? Locally, uh, the controller sent you a letter last week uh, sort of discussing certain concerns around data sharing for kind of third parties to be able to monitor the spending more, more closely in terms of the city spending on some of these uh, responses. I'm just wondering if you, know, you have you know, a response to that letter, if you have kind of any thoughts on kind of additional data sharing the city could be doing just in terms of having kind of full confidence in the estimates and the numbers. Uh, I don't see the lack of confidence. Uh, I stood here with our budget director. He clearly showed uh, the numbers and what, they're, what they are, and so the economic challenges that we're facing. Uh, we are at this phase in life where either you're going to believe or you're not going to believe. So if you want to stay in the universe, you being the control of the universe of, well, I just don't believe it. The reason I don't believe he believe it because I have yet to see him stay in the herc. I have yet to see him go among this. I, I don't know. Has he been to Washington? Can you ask him that, though? <laughs> Can you ask him, has he gone to Washington? This is the number one issue that is impacting New York City. Has he gone to Washington as a citywide leader? Okay, I, I don't think he has either. Um, security officers, you guys are talking about. I'm sorry, who? Posting security officers outside some of these shelters. Just wondering if security has been a concern. Um, just kind of the reason why. No, and that was interesting. Uh, when the deputy mayor and I went to the Roosevelt Hotel and we went to another location, uh, you know, and as I move around, I'm asking uh, the security personnel, 
Uh, you have uh, now uh, 40 something thousand people that are currently in our, in, in, in our care and they're saying security issues are not a problem at all. I, and I'm just really impressed with that uh, because when you put a large number of people together, uh, a lot of single men uh, together, uh, we're just not seeing security issues. And that is, uh, that is really impressive. They, it shows how much they want to come here. They want to participate, not disrupt our way of, of, way, of way of life. Well, we, it would be, hold on, hold on, hold on. It would be irresponsible not to have thousands of people at a location and not have security personnel. I would not allow that to ha happen. The, the omnipresence of public safety prevent actions from taking place. And so it would be irresponsible to have thousands of people at a location and not have some type of security. Uh, Jeff, and then Mike. Hey, Mr. Mayor, you, you said a few times that you've been a victim of your own success because of how well the city has housed. Yes. The migrants and the criticism has been that you maybe focus too well, too much on emergency housing and not on some of the other issues like legal issues, helping people file for asylum. So I'm wondering if you can address that at all. Do you think there needs to be like a two-pronged process to this to sort of help move people out of shelter more quickly as opposed to maybe just focusing on housing? Uh, no, I don't think there should be a two-prong. I think there needs to be an eight-prong. Um, you know, we need to be up in Albany fighting to build more housing because the inventory is wrong. Um, I have spoke to the leaders over the weekend, uh, Deputy Mayor Maria Torres Springer is up in, in Albany. We need to be in Washington, D.C. fighting to get our fair share of funding. Our teams has been in Washington, D.C. We need to make sure that we uh, look at any backlog of how we get people out of shelters and see what's in the way of doing so. Deputy Mayor uh, Sheena Wright has been doing that and under uh, Chief Housing Officer Jessica Katz, we have looked at those areas that we can bring people out and we continue to, uh, to uh, modify that. Uh, we need to be on the same prong of dealing with how do we find new locations and deal with some of the pushback that comes with the low location. Um, I need to make sure that my press team can deal with the inaccurate reporting that you guys are doing. I'm on a lot of prongs, man. <laughs> you know, two prong. I wish we did have two prong. <laughs> and this is this is this is a multi prong. I'm not drinking out of a water hose. I'm drinking out of a fire hose, and we are managing it. <laughs> um, Mr. Mayor, one of the obstacles um, you have to deal with in terms of people getting work permits is is people actually applying for asylum. And um, I believe it was last week, it may have been before, Deputy Mayor Isom talked about how not that many people relative to the overall influx have applied for asylum. What's the city doing to address that, to get those, help people get those applications in? Well, number one, there's a real backlog um, and on the national level, we need more people to hear the cases. That whole process, there's a bottleneck in the whole process. We need to find out ways to expedite that process, particularly what we're dealing with here. Uh, we have partnered with some great nonprofits who are assisting in filling out the applications, assi assisting people in going through this process. I think the process is too labor intensive. Uh, but, you know, I don't make those rules. Uh, but we have partnered with nonprofits. We're reaching out to our law schools uh, to uh, push this through. You know what, now that I think about CUNY Law School should come and give us a hand. Now that I think about it, you know, um, you know, since, you know, you yeah. want to be freedom fighters, come fight for freedom on the ground. You know, but we... Yeah, okay, I, I don't see them. Okay. So we need to, we need to get our uh, pro bono um, law firms to come in because there's a, there's a lot of paperwork, a lot needs to be done. We visited several sites and we want to continue to move this forward. The private law firms to, for that? Yes, we have. Mayor, I wonder if you can give us some sense of how much money the city is going to be spending to help these uh, faith-based groups run their programs and what the money will be used for in terms of providing services. Are these going to be respite sites? Are these going to be places where they can stay for long periods of time? Will it be food? Will it be shelter? Will it be legal? Just give us a sense of that. Yeah, it's cheaper than hotels. It's going to cost us about $125. 
uh, a night, uh, far cheaper than what we're paying in emergency hotels. And if we could, you know, as, as the deputy mayor has been trying to do, we're looking to drive down costs as much as possible uh, to bring down what this is, you know, costing taxpayers. Uh, and each site is different. You know, some of the sites that we're going to deal with may be just respite locations. Some could be able to hold people longer. So each site is different. It's, it's not a one size fit all. We don't have the exact numbers. The more we can put in our faith-based uh, locations, the better. I would rather people be in houses of worship where they're connected to people, community, care, and compassion than being in a congregate setting that's not connected to those things. We are trying to do that, but it's difficult when you're in a large setting of that magnitude. And so does this help them get jobs? Does this help them make connections to people what we have been doing, and I'm, in, I'm of the Gale Brewer Club. If they could work somewhere, I cannot tell them to do so. Uh, but if someone delivers my food, I'm not going to say, are you asylum seeker? Let me see your papers. That's not going to happen. You know, we are giving training to some. So when their job's available, once they finish the process and they're allowed to work, we're not starting from scratch. Talk about the decompression strategy here in the city of New York. What is Governor Hopewell's uh, take on that, and is she going to help you uh, in that decompression strategy? Uh, we sent a letter. We being four of the mayors that are impacted by this, we sent a letter to the White House to request a meeting with the president. Uh, the last time I spoke face to face to the president was probably earlier this year on this topic uh, at an event had an opportunity to speak with them. But other than that, we have, we have not. But we just sent a letter uh, to the White House uh, requesting uh, to sit down with the president and talk about this. Governor Hoko has been a partner. Uh, it's, it's unfortunate that some of our uh, county leaders of state don't realize, they don't realize that this is a statewide issue. Uh, we're dealing with the legal challenges that they're having. And we're going to continue to utilize the courts to assist us and having everybody understand that this is a humanitarian crisis that we have to face. It's a moving dollar amount. The more we can get in, the better. You know, I'm hoping this is a better return on our investment. It's a better uh, use of taxpayers' dollars as we could expand this as much as um, uh, as possible. You know, I was thinking about what you were saying about project hospitality, and I remember speaking with you over with COVID. Um, I was sleeping in Borough Hall. You were sleeping at one of the centers. And so that's the type of commitment that we can get. That's a better return on investment. So we don't know the exact dollar amount, but we would like to transition as much as possible um, out of these hercs into uh, you know, using this uh, method. But let's be clear, buses are still coming. I don't know how many buses we got over the weekend, Deputy Mayor. We got about four buses that are coming. So even when we find new spaces, we're getting new people to put in those spaces. And so it's, 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 that's part of the challenge that we have. That's why I keep saying this is not sustainable. Uh, we cannot uh, just you know, cross our fingers and hope we're not going to get you know, a few hundred to come in. This is just not sustainable. And we need a permanent fix and not a fix. Go ahead, go ahead. Get, get, get. Mayor, the um, city decades ago signed uh, the right to shelter. Yes. That doesn't mean that you personally believe there's a constitutional right to shelter. Do you personally believe, or does this administration believe, that there's a right to shelter under the state constitution? Uh, I, I believe that we should never put people in circumstances where we cannot give them the basic care that they deserve with the level of compassion and dignity that was provided to my families and uh, my family and others. That's what I believe in. Right now, we cannot give people uh, the care that they deserve based on the volume of what we are seeing. That's not sustainable. Is there a right to shelter? I, listen, listen. My belief 
is my belief. The court would decide what the city must do. And so I'm not going to get into what is your belief, what's not your belief. I believe we need to treat people with dignity, compassion, and respect. That's what I believe. That's how I was treated, uh, with dignity, compassion, and respect. And we want to do it to others. Faith, faith, leaders, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.